From his three collections of the Fashion Institute of Technology, this will be an interview with Shirley Goodman, Executive Vice President Emeritus, Executive Director of the Educational Foundation for the Fashion Industries. The date is February 7th, 1984. The interviewer is Mildred Finger. Shirley, why don't we start talking about all the things that led ultimately to your joining what was then not even a college. So could we start with where you were born and when and what you did? Well, I was born in Virginia and I grew up in North Carolina. When I was four years old, my parents moved to a very small town of about 2,000 population. My father at that time was a merchant. He had a general store and uh, later became quite prominent in the community. Uh, becoming not only a merchant, a justice of the peace, but um, he owned nine tobacco farms. My mother uh, was very knowledgeable and very talented. She worked in the store as well as managed our household and um, was president of the garden club and the book club and so forth and so on. Uh, I am Jewish and there were very few Jewish people in uh, the general community, in fact practically none in the town in which I lived. And the closest community to us was uh, 30 miles away. And in those years, because this goes back quite a long time, I'm not very young. Would uh, you tell us the day it goes back? Yes, uh, I was born in 1915. And so from the time that I was about, I would say, six or seven, when we had a first Model T Ford, my mother would make the trek every week with me and with my little sister to Durham, North Carolina, so that we would know something about our cultural background and our and go to Sunday school and, and meet other friends uh, of hers and my father. And that continued for a number of years. My mother died when I was 14. And uh, there were other incidents in the family which were unfortunate. And the depression came. And in 1930, uh, my father lost almost everything that he had. I had one sister younger than I, five years, and we were 250 miles away from the closest member of the family, which created something of a problem. I finished high school when I was 16, and I had studied music and had been in state competitions and been successful and had hoped to go on and, and uh, study music at university in North Carolina, but it was necessary instead for me to move to Washington, D.C. with my little sister to live with the only sister my mother had left. Uh, so she made a home for us, and uh, in Washington I went to business school. I continued, however, studying music. Uh, when I finished business school, uh, of course I had to earn a living, and I had to support myself and my sister. My father at that time was not able to, and I was very fortunate. I was in Washington at the right time, in the right place, and I was able to get a first job, which was truly uh, beyond my capabilities, but I managed to hold it and to learn, and that was in the Public Works Administration with a man who was the first general counsel. He had been uh, a very important corporate lawyer in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and had come to Washington to help set up the legal division of the Public Works Administration under President Roosevelt. The um, office was in the Office of Interior. In fact, my office was next to Secretary Ickes at the time. Mm. And while I was extremely young, I was 18, um, I was taught a great deal, and I managed to stay with that job uh, as long as Lloyd Landau, who was holding it, wanted to keep it. He had decided to go back into private practice, and I moved on to the Federal Housing Administration, the office of the Deputy Administrator, and stayed there learning much more because it was a whole new field of housing and I learned about banking and I learned about insurance and I continued to learn about legal matters. I stayed there working finally with a man who came from New York who was a protege of George McEnany, then a president of the Title Guarantee Trust Company and also president of the Regional Plan in New York. It was in 1930s, the beginning of 1936 and uh, Mr. McEnany came to Washington and asked Leslie Baker, the man with whom I had been working, to come to New York and be executive secretary of the first New York World's Fair. Mm. And uh, Mr. Baker asked me to join him and be a member of the staff, and I had nothing to keep me in Washington at that point. 
and I thought it would be fine to move on to New York, although I didn't know this city. I had visited here, but I didn't know it. So I came to New York in January of 1936, and it's funny, I, <laughs> I remember my first experience. I had to report to work at the office, which was downtown at 120 Broadway, and I found myself uptown in the Bronx. Oh. So <laughs> I obviously got on the wrong subway going in the wrong direction, and that was my introduction to my first work day in New York. Um, in, the, in the spring of that year, Mr. McEnany became chairman of the board of the foundation, and Grover Whalen, who was well known to most people, became president. And I thought, well, there's no place for me. I'll just have to go back to Washington. But fortunately, Mr. Whalen asked me if I would stay, and he said that he needed in his office two executive secretaries, one who would uh, handle foreign relations because part of the World's Fair would deal with foreign countries and the other part would be responsible for the construction of the fair, and that person would coordinate the activities of the Office of Chief Engineer and the Office of the President. And he took a friend of mine who was working there, Francis Cross, and me to dinner, and he flipped a coin. And Francis got foreign, and I got domestic. And I must say I'm grateful, because in those years that I worked in the pre-fair period, uh, I met and worked with some of the most important people in the city of New York, from Mayor LaGuardia to Robert Moses to uh, the engineers who built the fair, Mr. Whalen, who taught me a tremendous amount about public relations and handling special events. It was a great education. I worked many, many hours. I didn't have much of a social life, uh, but I was not unhappy. In uh, 38, Jack Madigan, who was the president of the firm of Madigan Highland and had been basically responsible for much of the development of the financing for the public projects that Robert Moses had been interested in, the large uh, roads and, and bridges and huge construction projects that benefited the city and state so much, asked me if I would go with Mr. Moses who had, to the Constitutional Convention of the State of New York. Uh, Mr. Moses had been elected a delegate, and it was to be a summer job, and he assured me that it would be great fun, and I would have an opportunity to meet many, many important people in Albany who would, were coming from all over the state, and I accepted. And I went with uh, the man who was his legal representative, uh, his name was Highland, and together we spent that summer working with Mr. Moses in Albany at the Constitutional Convention, where indeed I did meet almost everyone of importance in the state politically, from the governor and his council down to um, judges and other important people who had been appointed delegates, one of whom was a man by the name of Edward Weinfeld. Then he a judge? He was then a lawyer. Today he is yep. a federal court right, judge. Right. Uh, but he was a, a very close friend of Governor Lehman's. In fact, he was almost like Governor Lehman's protege. They were extremely close friends. Sure, well, I want to interrupt for just a yes. moment. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Everything that you're saying indicates that you discovered what networking is before that word was ever coined. That's right. You met everybody you met, you met then somebody else. That's right. And, and I think that that's extremely important. Now, some people call that being opportun opportunistic. Well, I don't see anything wrong with being opportunistic. Uh, I don't think you need to be pushy about it, but I think it's, it's very helpful if you're going to have a career to take advantage of every opportunity that presents itself. And as I've said many times, timing is terribly important. When the Constitutional Convention was over, I continued to work with Mr. Moses because he was interested in, in uh, legislation that had to do with grade crossing elimination. But unfortunately, I'm sorry, what? grade crossing elimination. During that period of time, I had an accident. I broke my back and I was put out of commission in New York for a considerable period of time. I was in New York hospital for three months, didn't know whether I'd walk again. Fortunately for me, I was able to. But I went back to Washington but to recuperate. My father then had a home in Washington, and I was able to live there. And for a year, I was in a steel brace, and I wasn't supposed to work, but I couldn't be idle. And I had an opportunity to have a great experience of working on the Paul McNutt for President campaign. And there again, because I worked with two men who were pretty wonderful, uh, a later opportunity came to me from the White House, which I'll get to, I suppose. 
At any rate, at the end of that year, uh, I came back to New York because Edward Weinfeld had been made State Commissioner of Housing, the first State Commissioner. And he called and asked if I was ready to come back and if I would come and help staff the state offices and work with him. I had fallen in love with a young doctor in New York and I was anxious to come back and so of course I did and um, we worked together very happily uh, until the war. I had meanwhile been married and had a child, a son, and in 1942, my husband having gone overseas, uh, I was asked by the White House through the person with whom I had worked on the McNutt campaign to come down to Washington to be the executive secretary of the Rubber Survey Committee, which was being chaired by Bernard Baruch, Mr. Conant, and Mr. Compton, president of Harvard and MIT. And I accepted that offer and went down to Washington and again had a really a wonderful experience. But at that time, the young lawyers whom I had met when I first went to work in Washington had become extremely important, like Ben Cohn, Tommy Cochran, they were all my friends. And I, fortunately for me, have been able to keep friends through the years. So that experience was a very good experience. I had to come back to New York because I had no way to take care of my child, and I was forced to stop work in, um, I think, 1943. Uh, my husband didn't come back from overseas until the end of 45. I didn't see him for over three years. I did what I could to manage. I ghost wrote a book and I did a lot of typing to earn some money. But basically those years were ones of taking care of my child and my home. I hadn't expected to return to work. Uh, after the war, I had a second son and one day I got off the bus at 57th Street and 5th Avenue and someone yelled, hey, sure. And it was Grover Whalen. And he said, come on, take a walk with me up the street to the Metropolitan Club. I want to show you something. And I did. And he said, you know, I've just rented all this space. We're going to have a golden anniversary for the city of New York in 1948. This was in 47. And uh, how about working for me for two or three weeks and hiring the people to staff this place and putting it together, and, and I said, you know, my husband doesn't want me to work for over. He said, oh, just for two weeks. So I went home and discussed it, and uh, of course I went to work for Grover for the two weeks, and I've been working ever since. Now, during the golden anniversary, there were three things that uh, were done. The first was to pay tribute to the major industry of the city and state of New York, which was the fashion industry. That meant, uh, a history of the industry, which was done by Professor Alan Nevins from Columbia, and a fashion show which was produced by Ellen Lambert and Tom Lee that was then presented in Grand Central Palace, no longer in existence, twice a day for 30 days. That event, Grover said, Shirley, you coordinate. Well, we had to have an industry committee, and many people were invited to meet with Mr. Whalen some of whom represented the union, and some represented retailing, and some represented manufacturing. And out of that group, one man, Sam Deach, who was then the president of a coat and suit firm, Deach, Wurzburg, and Coppola, objected to every suggestion that was made. And when the meeting was over, Grover said to me, what will we do? And I said, make Mr. Deach the chairman of the industry committee, which he did. And from that moment on, Sam Deach and I were very close friends. Now, Sammy had been one of the founders of the Fashion Institute of Technology when it was a post-high school technical institute. The industry founded the school uh, because they needed talented young people who would have careers in de design and in management, and they weren't getting them from other institutions, even from colleges like MIT. So they founded their own school of higher learning with the Board of Education to provide them the personnel they needed. And it was an experiment that was to last five years and paid for by the industry through grants from different segments of the industry. Well, in 1948, State University of New York came into being. The school was then in its fourth year. The industry knew they had an experiment that was working and they wanted their school to become a college under the State University program. 
So when the golden anniversary was over, Mr. Deach and others who had been founders of the school persuaded me to come down to FIT to help write legislation that would have to be passed in Albany in order for this institute to become a community college under the State University of New York. And I agreed to come for six months. I've been here 35 years. Before you go on, um, I just wanted to make a point. It seems to me from what, what you've talked about so far that by that time you had, uh, you had worked for the city, state, and federal agencies. Therefore, Never. you had a sense of the structure of all three things. I, think. I had a sense of the structure of all three, and I knew most of the people who were important in the various agencies. And they were basically my friends. Um, I never had a problem meeting or having people work with me in any of those areas. So that when I came to FIT and I worked with uh, the council for the college, of, for the institute at that time, Fred Cooper, we got along very well. Uh, I also found that the uh, foundation which held the original charter for the founding of the institution was very limited in its scope. The original institute had programs only for manufacturing of clothes, the design of clothes, and the design of textiles. It didn't cover any other area of fashion. And I knew that if we were to become a college, we would have to broaden the base of the institution and we'd have to get far more people involved in the industry to support the program. And also, I felt very strongly, as did the founders, that in uh, establishing FIT as a community college, it was extremely important to keep the integrity of the industry and to keep the support of the industry as a partner in the operation. So the legislation was written that way. It was quite unusual, but it was written that when FIT became a community college under the State University of New York, it would be supported in part by the Educational Foundation for the Fashion Industries. As a community college, the, fa the uh, college had its own board of trustees, four of whom were appointed by the governor and five by the local sponsor, which was the Board of Education. But the Educational Foundation had its own board of directors, mm -hmm. and together there was a liaison between the two, and the two together operated the college. The operating costs of the college came basically from the state, the city, and tuition, but scholarships, as scholarship assistance, monies for special events, uh, for publications, for all those things for which public money could not be used came through the foundation. And that has not changed. That has grown extensively. Uh, it's now a vital part of, of FIT. Uh, I feel now, as I did then, that because of the support of industry, because of the interest of the caliber of the people who make up the directorship of the foundation, FIT has had its flexibility, has had its ability to grow, has had its, a lot of its success and acceptance. I think had it been a traditional college, just as an educational institution, without this close involvement with the community that it serves, it would have been a, quite a different kind of institution. Was it then called the Educational Foundation for it the Fashion Originally, industry? it was called the Educational Foundation for the Apparel mm -hmm. Industries. And several years later, we changed it to Fashion Industries when we broadened the programs of the college. Uh, many times, we tried to change the name of the college, but it had become so well known as FIT. Mm -hmm. uh, employers were advertising for so many years of experience or FIT graduate that no other name that was suggested ever took its place, and we've remained the Fashion Institute of Technology. Well, were you, were you yourself uh, ever on the FIT payroll? or you Always on the FIT payroll. Oh, not on the Education Foundation? No, never until recently. Always on the FIT payroll. When I first came, I was an administrator. It's very funny, because no. we have our 40th birthday coming up uh, in, 19, in this year, mm -hmm. 1984, okay. and I was down in the dead files looking for some information, and I. I found a great deal that interested me, and I even found what my first titles were. For instance, I have uh, the dedication of, of the first, an installation of the first president of the college, Mortimer Ritter, and I find on that that I was secretary of the board of trustees and assistant to the president. And then as I looked uh, the next year, I became ad administrative assistant uh, to the president, but always stayed press secretary of the board of trustees. 
Um, and as the foundation came to be more important, I became the executive director of the Educational Foundation. But until 1978, I was always on the payroll mm -hmm. of the college. Mm -hmm. I have, had been executive vice president and then acting president. Right. Uh, I still, at the same time, manage the Educational Foundation, mm -hmm. the Student Faculty Corporation, and the dormitories. I was on the board of both of the housing uh, projects that we have. Uh, I didn't find that difficult because they were all interrelated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it is true that at one period, the foundation uh, did did give an additional amount of money to certain administrators of the college to subsidize certain expenses, and I was one of those so privileged. It was never a large amount of money. Today, however, uh, since I have retired as executive vice president and I am not on the payroll of the foundation, I do receive a salary from the educational foundation. You're not on the payroll of the institute. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not on the payroll of the college. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to get a little bit, uh, to have something put on the table about that subject. But let's go back to your chronology, which is really very good. You had, now you have just joined FIT. Well, when I joined FIT, I really didn't know anything about fashion. And I had to learn a great deal about the industry. Oh, I knew surface information because in the year that I had worked with the industry, I had learned who people were and what they were responsible for. and and uh, who, who you go to for certain kinds of advice. But when I became involved with the college, I needed to know much more. I needed to know how, how products were produced, both in the textile industry and the apparel industry. I had to know the differences in quality and, mass and certain mass production items. I had to understand the relationship between the retailer and the, the manufacturer, and I had to understand the communications of the industry. And I was very uh, lucky in that the founders of the college were wonderful people. Sammy Deach, Max Meyer, who had been a coat and suit manufacturer and then became a banker, Mars Haft, who was one of the largest coat and suit manufacturers in the country, uh, other people in retailing, people in the union, were all my teachers. Uh, they took me by the hand. I think at one point I could have laid out a factory mm -hmm. and understood a uh, how clothes should function in production. Um, I went with Mr. Deach to Europe. I learned to, to judge collections, to, to be able to interpret what was being shown. Um, I went with Mr. Meyer to many places. He always said to me, if you don't go out, surely you can't bring anything back. Don't ever let anyone keep you at your desk. Well, it was very good advice in those days. Today it's a little difficult. <laughs> but um, they were wonderful. There was nothing that they would not help me with. There was one man in the industry who was the director of public relations for coat and suit industry. His name was Bertram Reinitz. Bert Reinitz gave me very sound advice. He used to say to me, don't let anybody push you. Don't let anybody make you do anything until you're ready, until you think you're ready to do it. And he was, of course, talking about publicity because many people wanted a lot of publicity at that time about the school. And we really weren't ready. We didn't have a sound product. He said, build your product before you talk about it. And I had to struggle against many people through many years in order to hold back until we really were ready. But when we were ready, we went forward. Now, shortly after I came to FIT, unfortunately, the first president, Mortimer Ritter, who incidentally was a principal of the high school that these same people had, had founded in the early 30s, the Central High School of Needle Trades, um, had a heart attack. And he never really got well again. He wasn't able to devote much time to the institution. And he died uh, not long after I came. Actually, um, at that point, we didn't have a president. and. He died in 1953. We had to search for a president. Max Meyer, who was the chairman of the Board of Trustees, became acting president, and we had a search committee of which I was one member. And we found, through um, Lawrence Jarvie, who was the executive dean of the State University of New York, a man who was the president of the New Haven College on the campus of Yale University. His name was Lawrence L. Bethel. We were using his textbooks on management in our 
Management Production Program. We persuaded him to take a year's leave of absence and to come to FIT. He was a fine educator. He was extremely well known in the United States for his belief in a two-year college program because that's what we were when we were founded. We were a two-year community college with an associate degree in applied science. He was highly respected in the field of junior colleges and he did come with us with the understanding that if we could not provide him with a campus and, and a future for the institution, he would return to the Yale campus. He was ready to go back when we were finally able to persuade the city and the state that we needed our own facility because we were then housed in two rented floors in the high school building on 24th Street. And I want to take credit for having persuaded Mayor Robert Wagner at that time that we needed the facility, that we needed the land. I brought him to the site that we had chosen and he did go along with all of it and we were able to show uh, Lawrence Bethel that we would have our own campus and that what he could year? build an institution. We, we started to do that, I believe the year was 1954. Um, we got approval to construct our first building in 1954 because he would have gone back at the end of that year. We then had to, of course, choose the architects. We were given a, a choice of several firms by the Board of Education and we chose a firm of the Young and Moskowitz and uh, I began to work with them from the very beginning on the plans and the construction of the first building which is the building where my office is and has been since that building was completed in 1959. Um, that building... And that was the first of the building. That was the first building, and that building was built, we thought at the time, we had a great study done for 1,200 students. When we began plans for the building, we had 400 students. And we didn't foresee that we would need a facility any larger than one to accommodate 1,200 students. We moved the students into this building for the first time in September of 1959, when I had just come back mm -hmm. from, the, mm -hmm. from Russia. I had been the director, liaison officer for the American National Exhibition in Moscow, representing the fashion industry. The students came in here for the first time. And Who picked you for that, by the way? Leonard Hankin and the and an industry committee. Um, within two years, we had outgrown this facility. We were filled. And so we had to begin to plan. What were the dormitory facilities? We didn't have we didn't a dormitory know. then, no. Uh, we had to begin to plan for the future. Well, Larry Bethel built our educational programs. He, he got us accredited as a, as a college. We received full accreditation. The first dormitory came on stream in 1962. That was Nagler Hall. And uh, uh, Larry really helped to establish a firm educational base for FIT. But unfortunately, he died in 1965. Just after we had been to Israel and done a survey and helped Israel establish the program, which ultimately became the Shankar College in Tel Aviv. He died of cancer in 1965, and again, we were without a president. Samuel Deitch became the acting president, and we started a search for a president. We went to many people, we interviewed many people, and finally we went back to the man who had helped us in the very beginning, Lawrence Jarvie. Mm -hmm. He was no longer executive dean of the state university. He was then superintendent of schools in Flint, Michigan, but he had also the junior college just under his supervision. We persuaded him to come back to New York and to be our president. It was a very wise decision because he was extremely knowledgeable in terms of the state university and the city of New York. And at that point in our growth, we needed some a president who could work very closely with both government mm -hmm. agencies. He came back and we had thought he would stay for quite a long while. But at the end of five years, he felt that uh, he needed to leave and we had grown considerably. We had all of our new buildings on stream, a 10-year study committee that had been chaired by uh, Mr. Fairchild, Louis Fairchild, uh, Fairchild Publications, mm -hmm. had proved that we needed to grow 
and that we needed to expand our base programs. And so we had planned the additional facilities which now encompassed the campus uh, to accommodate a maximum of 10,000 students. Uh, again, we worked with de Young and Moskowitz, and I was asked to coordinate the entire construction program, which I did. And these buildings, the new buildings, began to come on stream. I believe the first one was in 1972, was completed in 72. We had many delays along the way. Meanwhile, when Larry Jarby left, uh, I became acting president. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not my choice. I did not want to be president of FIT. I felt that my strengths were those of working closely with the industry and the various industrial programs rather than in administrating an institution which had great problems in dealing with unions and finance and other things, which I didn't particularly mm. enjoy. But I was acting president for a year until we found Marvin Feldman. And we found him through the chancellor of the State University of New York, who was then Ernie Goya. And uh, Marvin came in as president and has been here since. And during his term of office, we have continued to grow. Uh, we've continued to add to our programs so that we cover almost mm -hmm. every aspect of the total fashion industries. There are now some 12,000 students at FIT. We've outgrown this facility. We certainly have outgrown our two dormitories where we house about 1,000 students. And incidentally, that's a very significant factor because one of the things that we insisted upon in the very beginning was that there'd be no geographic boundaries for FIT, that the fashion community was a worldwide community, and it was our responsibility to find talent and bring it to FIT and keep it, if possible, in New York to keep our industry strong. That has always been our goal, and it hasn't changed. It's true that some students who come from other parts of the world go back to the countries from which they came. But for the most part, through the years, we have kept the largest percentage of our graduates in the metropolitan New York area. And the largest number of our students have come from New York State and, of course, the within commuting distance of New York City. Um, could you expand a little bit uh, about the um, uh, work that you did with Girl Well and uh, events for the Golden Anniversary of New York. Yes, following the um, first event, which which had to do with the uh, fashion industries, the second was to be a cultural event. We brought over the Paris Opera Ballet from Paris. That was the first time they'd ever been here, and it was a very exciting experience. And the third event was the opening of what was then uh, Idlewild, the airport. Now, Kennedy International Airport, and I'll never forget that because <laughs> we would have a, a luncheon for the President of the United States preceding the opening of the airport, and Mr. Whalen had asked me to seat the dais, and we had a five-tier dais, and I was locked up with Secret Service for two days because they had to know where absolutely every single person was going to be. And that was quite quite the experience in the Waldorf because we seated the balconies and the entire uh, grand ballroom and the adjacent areas, and then the president didn't arrive. Instead, if at that time Governor Dewey uh, was in Albany and Truman was president, and the two of them didn't want to arrive in any place at the same time, it was really very funny. So they both came from opposite directions and helicopters landing at the airport. And I was left with a bus cortege to take out to the airport. And for the first time, on the first seat of the first bus, I rode with Cardinal Spellman, who had never been in a public transportation before. He had never been on a city bus. So that was a very exciting event. Those were the three major things that happened during uh, that year. But I don't think you, you talk much about the kind of salute that was done. And I think it's interesting, because in the uh, events in recent years involving the fashion industry, They've never really been united. Well, the fashion industry salute was a very important one, and it was a united effort. The, uh, the history, which was then published by American Fabrics magazine, was a very beautiful publication, and it did tell the story of the fashion industries, of how it had originated with immigrants coming to this country, building large organizations and firms, and having the need to have the second generation follow in their footsteps, but having the second generation become 
professional people, lawyers, doctors, dentists, and so forth, and uh, their recognition of the fact that they had to build their own generation of people to, to continue the success that they had built in establishing the fashion industry. So the industry came together to support that project. It was done, the, the uh, publication was done through paid advertising and through contributions. The fashion show itself was a wonderful fashion show. It was the first time, and I must say that Eleanor and Tom did a superb Eleanor job. Eleanor Lambert. Eleanor and Lambert. Tom Eleanor brought to the public the fact that you could you could buy beautiful fashions, well produced at any price that you could afford to pay. It. I remember seeing. I can't remember, I think there were 30 Susie Perrette dresses, mm -hmm. the same number on a runway at the same time, in different sizes, to show that a, for a very modest price, you could get a well-produced fashion garment from our industry. So that fashion show, which took place twice a day in Grand Central Palace to very large audiences, was made up of a, a cross-section of what our industry produced. And, and the industry did co cooperate. They, they made their things available. It was a wonderful show. It was staged by Tom Lee, who was a, a display and interior designer at that time. And I think it was extremely successful. It went on for 30 days twice a day mm -hmm. and to very large audiences. I think the industry appreciated it. I think they understood what uh, the city was saying. Uh, Mr. Whalen was a master of public relations mm -hmm. and promotion. There has never been anyone like him in the city of New York since. No one who understood this city the way that he did and that was able to tell its story so that it could be accepted and, and, and was liked and appreciated. He had a knack for getting people to do things together. Uh, it's true he never hesitated about costs. Sometimes he was very extravagant, but he always felt that the result was worthwhile. He had a love affair with New York City, and he wanted everybody in the world to know it. And, and he obviously had great uh, public relations gift. He had a tremendous public relations gift. At the time, he was chairman of Cody. Uh, prior to that, he had been police commissioner. He had been the president of Wanamakers, and uh, he had a good knowledge of the fashion industry. He'd also been um, a president of Chanel Industries. So he had a broad uh, business experience, but through that entire business life of his, he had always been involved in being Mr. New York, as it were. He was the official greeter, in quotes, for the city of New York. And he, he did that with um, great love. He thoroughly enjoyed it. And great flair. And a great flair, mm -hmm. a great flair. Um, let's, could we talk about, could you talk about what you did in the USSR in 59 and in 67? Yes, in 1959, the industry, again, as a coordinated effort, uh, showed the, the, apparel industry. the apparel industry, the fashion industries only, it was our part of the, of the exhibition in Sokolnicki Park, decided to, to produce a show that would show how America lived through the clothes that we wore. We had 84 members of the group from age 4 to age 70, uh, all ethnic people, all ethnic races were involved, who made up America. It was a show that was produced by Bert Shevelov and directed by Joe Layton. Hmm. It was their beginning. It was rehearsed right here at FIT in an empty building before anybody came. And we took the group to Russia. We were to give the show twice a day. 84 people? 84 people. We had a charter flight going over. Uh, we had a tremendous wardrobe of clothes, everything from the most inexpensive to the most expensive, worn in what was a, a very lively presentation. It was actually a Broadway show. It was dance and song and, and uh, clothes mm -hmm. and Russian interpretation. and. Um, it was done twice a day in Sokolnicki Park to, I cannot tell you how many people, thousands and thousands of people stood for hours waiting to see that show. In fact, Khrushchev came and I was the one who was selected to give him a fountain pen from, <laughs> from the runway, which is very funny. And it was just after the conversation with ex-president Nixon in the uh, kitchen, the kitchen conversation mm -hmm. where I was also. But the show was very successful in Russia. Uh, the, the group 
which had high school kids and little kids and mo professional models and uh, a nurse and a man who's now a television commentator, Gilbert Noble. Um, they were all members of my cast. In fact, I got Gil and his wife married in Russia, which was quite a, a, a thing to do because they didn't want it to happen in Russia. They, the nobles wanted it, but the Russians Russia didn't want it. Yeah. But um, Ambassador Thompson, our ambassador, has allowed me to use the, um, his home, his residence. He and Mrs. Thompson were very helpful. They were away part of the time. And through a great deal of complicated red tape, we managed to get a civil, cer civil ceremony for the nobles, Jean and, and Gil, and they've still been happily married ever since. But um, that was a great experience because Russia was not easy in 1959. It was the first time that the country had been open. Uh, we, had, we had to keep my group together, so we had to be housed in the same place. Transportation was difficult. Food was scarce and not very good then. And, uh, but we had a successful, as far as we could tell, presentation. Yeah, I'm sorry, how, long, how many days did you say? That? We were there eight weeks. Eight weeks? Yes, it was a very long time. I lost 22 pounds in those eight weeks. It was a, a harrowing experience. It was very difficult functioning in Russia then. But we got back all right. We didn't have the charter to bring us back and didn't know how we were going to get back. But I managed to sell all the clothes in the show and raise the money, and KLM brought us back. It was not an easy time. I went back in 1967 for a trade show. Again, Eleanor was involved in that particular show that was Eleanor being Lambert. Eleanor Lambert. And I was asked to go back because of having been there before and having known my way around and to help in, in any way that I could the person who was responsible for that trade show. And I did go back. Uh, Russia had changed a little bit. There was a little more food, a little better. We stayed in a better hotel, but all the people whom I had known in 1959 had disappeared. I could not find one person, not one person, with whom we had worked. You mean and you had their, their names and addresses? Names and addresses, <laughs> and they obviously were important people, or they wouldn't have been assigned to us in the first instance, but no one was, a, no one was a, available. So the 1967 experience was a short experience. I did not stay very long, and um, I, was, I was not unhappy to go back. I have no desire to return. Uh, on the first ex in the first experience, we had not only the fashion show, we, we had a hairdressing establishment. So I was responsible also for those people, for the operators, some of whom spoke Russian quite well. And uh, we didn't have too many restrictions at that time. We were able to travel. And we, and we had rubles. Uh, we had to go through uh, their travel service, but uh, we were allowed to go. I went to Kiev and to Leningrad and, and other, other parts of Russia, and some people even went further. Uh, I never had time to Because do all of this had taken place in Moscow, I think. Yes, the Sokolnik Park was in Moscow, mm -hmm. but there were weekends when some of us could be free and we would take off for two or three days. We tried to rotate. It was very hard working seven days a week uh, under the circumstances under which we were. So I tried to have a rotating schedule so everybody could have some free time. But it was not a, it was an interesting experience, but a very difficult experience. I'm not sorry that I had it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um, I would not want to repeat it. The, um, I think we have not, um, finished the chronology of your life during this period. So. Could we go back a little bit? And well, uh, I was married. And incidentally, I'm terribly interested. In, I think we are ter We all would be interested in having you discuss from your own experience at a very early date how a, a, a career woman combined that with being a working mother, being yeah, a mother. Not easy. <laughs> I, um, I was married to a doctor for 28 years. I went back to work when my youngest son was 11 months old and my oldest son, who was, was five years older, almost six. He was in the first grade, I believe, at that time, or else in kindergarten, I don't remember. I was very fortunate in that I had an excellent, responsible woman living in my home, whom I trusted, who uh, was knowledgeable, and with whom I felt my children were secure. I, um, at the end of the golden anniversary, I weighed very carefully whether I wanted to continue working. To be perfectly frank, I was offered several 
excellent opportunities in industry at large amounts of money. But I decided that if I was going to work while my children were growing up, I wanted to be able to have time with them. So when I decided to stay with the Fashion Institute of Technology, it provided me an opportunity to have my weekends with my children, to have vacations that I could spend with my children as they were growing up, and to have hours that would let me at least have dinner with them most of the time. So that kept me from feeling guilty in terms of, of having to work and uh, have children mm -hmm. unsupervised. My children were well supervised and I planned activities around them on weekends and on holidays. Uh, because my husband was a doctor, he could not always get away, so we developed um, the fun of fishing because in fishing you could go off with your children at the spur of the moment and do things together that we could all enjoy. Uh, there were many problems in working, particularly as my job became more important and I, um, I found that I was having a career. I had not originally wanted to have a career, it was just nor, a job. nor had expected to have yeah. a career. But it grew into a career and it wasn't something then that I wanted to give up. First of all, I needed to work. We needed the income. When you live in the city of New York and you have two children, you have to go to private school and that one income, even though uh, your husband might be a professional person, uh, it's, it was necessary at that time to have a larger income. So I work from necessity as well as from desire. I don't think it's easy for a woman to build a career and raise a family at the same time. Uh, it's a totally different responsibility from that of a man. Because you have, you have to run your home, you have to supervise your marketing and your meal, you have to really supervise your children's growth and support. But basically most of the decisions have to be yours. And if there's a problem during the course of the day, it's you who are, who are called. So it, it, it's, a, it's, it's not easy. I think um, you have to be able to more or less categorize your activities. You have to be able to put certain things aside when you're doing other things and then make them all come together. And it can be tiring because you have, in addition to your job and your children, you have your husband whom you love and the social life that you want to have together. So uh, I think it's much more difficult for a woman than it is for a man. Um, and of course, there are other problems. If your career is a successful career and you become known and fairly important, there are always egos involved. And uh, I'm not a sociologist, but um, I do know that the male ego sometimes is hurt if the female is a little more important or is better known or gets more attention. And this becomes a problem, and I think women have to be aware of this if they want to have a good life together with their husband and with their children. Uh, I worked very hard at it. I really did work very hard at it. I stayed in my marriage until after my children had completed their college education, until I felt that they were could be independent and could go on their own. I still love my ex-husband very, very much but we were moving in different directions. And so we separated. I thought I needed some time to get myself together. Unfortunately, after we separated, I became ill. And um, that was what year? 1968. Mm -hmm. And I had traveled, I had been in Europe and I had been in the Orient and I came back and I was living alone temporarily. And an old friend whom I had met through FIT who was also separated, was very attentive and very helpful to me at that time. I later married him in 1970. Uh, two years after I had separated from my husband, uh, I married Hyman Brown. You met him at FIT? Yes. I met Hy because he <coughs> has, Hy owns large studios on 26th Street just behind Nagel Hall. And one day in the early 60s, after I moved, after we had moved into this building, he called and said to me, uh, we're producing on one of the stages a, a film. I think it was Butterfield 8, if I remember correctly, with Elizabeth Taylor. And I thought, he thought perhaps our students might be interested in seeing how a movie was made. And he invited uh, the students to come over 
to, to visit the studio. I invited him to come over here so that we could meet and get to know each other. And I did, and we became friends, both he and his wife, and my husband and I. We were very good friends. Uh, High and his wife <coughs> had separated a long time before uh, I did. Our separations had nothing to do with each other. Uh, they were very personal, and one thing did nothing to relate to each other. But because we were alone, we were thrown together when, at the time when I needed someone, and uh, we really fell in love. We got married in 1970, and it's been a very, very good marriage. Our interests are, are very similar. Uh, we like doing the same things. We don't have some of the distractions that you have when your children are small and growing up. We can uh, devote a lot of time to each other. We are both successful. He is extremely successful in his field, which is radio production. And, um, we, don't, we don't get in each other's way in any as far as I can tell, I haven't been aware of it. So I think I have, again, been extremely fortunate. Um, I have a wonderful family. My children are grown. My oldest son is an artist, and he's an associate professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology. My youngest son lives in California, and he designs software for computers, a very responsible company. He was with Walt Disney. He's now with a new firm in San Francisco. I have one grandson, the son of my oldest son, uh, who is 17 and lives in Connecticut with his mother, who remarried after an early divorce. Um, everyone is well and happy and moving forward. Mm. My husband has two children a son who lives in California and produces commercials, and a daughter who is, um, I don't quite know how to describe her, I guess she's a parapsychologist, but mm -hmm. she has a number of clients and she moves about the country. She is not now married. She has been married three times. He has, Hi has two granddaughters, both of whom are in New York. They're in their early 20s. My ex-husband remarried happily, and we are still extremely good friends. We see each other and talk quite often. You are really an extended family. Very extended family. Mm. Well, what, when you were, um, in 1968 must have been a very uh, busy time because you had things going on in your personal life, but there were also things, I assume, going on uh, at whatever level at the, at the college. Yes, uh, 68 was, was a very uh, busy time. It was when Dr. Jarvis was here as as president, it was when I was very much involved in the expansion of the school. In fact, I had been to the Orient to look at textile factories and mills to see whether there were ideas that we should incorporate into our laboratories. I had been to Europe for the same purpose. Uh, I worked very closely with the architects in the development of plans for all of our buildings, and of course with faculty and, and chairman of departments here to be sure that their needs would be incorporated into what we were doing, and we were pretty good at it. We didn't have to change very much. It's, we've been pretty much the same as, uh, and, and content. Of course, we must keep pace all the time with the new things that develop. But before you get into that, uh -huh. I really was uh, wondering whether there was any impact on this school of the kind of student unrest that was happening in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. There was very little student unrest in this school. In fact, we have had very little from the very beginning and very little destruction. And I think the reason is that the students have always been carefully selected and they've always been career oriented. And to be a student at FIT, you have to work very hard. So you don't have time for a lot of extracurricular activities that, such as you have at liberal arts colleges. It's a whole different temperament. It's a whole different kind of student. Now, that may change, but until now, that has been our experience. Mm -hmm. We haven't had a drug scene. We've had practically, well, so few incidents that I don't even recall any of any significant importance. No, no drug scene, no alcohol scene? Not that I know of. There might have been some <coughs> rare incidents in the dormitory that were handled very nicely, but nothing that is prevalent or nothing that we've had any, mm -hmm. any problem with that I know of, and I think the dean of students would probably concur in that. Um, I know. I think we've been very lucky. Mm -hmm. very lucky. Um, let's talk about a number of other things that have um, uh, both that have that have existed as of the early uh, or mid '40s, but also um, have continued to, to 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 grow and evolve until today. For example, your school population at the beginning. 
Uh, and when I say at the beginning, I don't mean the day that the doors were open, but... No, well, the day the right. doors were open, there were 100 students. That was down at the other school. That right? was at the other, in, in the other building, and that was a post-high school technical institute. That grew to be 400 students. When we came into this first building that we built, we came with the 400 students. And within two years, it had grown to full capacity, which was 1,200. Well, was there an outreach program that... Well, the, there was not too much of an outreach program. We, we did do recruiting in some of the high schools and with some of the high school principals in the city of New York, but there were some events that took place that brought a little attention to the school. You must remember, we were sponsored by the Board of Education of the city of New York, and in the early years, the superintendent of schools was a liaison between the Board of Education and the Board of Trustees of the college. He came to all the meetings. Bill Jansen. He was extremely helpful. The president of the Board of Education was always a trustee of the Fashion Institute of Technology. We had this very close affiliation with the Board of Education in the city of New York. So we had access to the high schools, and our, our uh, counselors could go into the high schools and talk about the programs and tell about the need for the uh, for jobs in the industry and the opportunities for careers in the various sections of the industry. So we did some publicity, of course. We made some films that could be shown. We, we did some publications that could be distributed, but we didn't have a big program. We didn't have any funding for a major uh, program of recruitment. Um, there were some wonderful people in FIT in the beginning. The first dean of faculty was Rosalind Ritter. She was an amazing lady. Uh, she was even-tempered. She Never she related to, more, to no, there was no right relation. Her name, maiden name was Snyder. She just had married a man whose name was Ritter. She was a fine educator. She was an English major, I believe. But she was so good at handling people and at keeping everything moving. We also had an associate dean whose name was Molly Sloman, and she was an absolutely wonderful person. She knew more about design and production than anyone I have ever known. Her standards were extremely high, and she kept on top of her technical faculty. She, we have never replaced, uh, uh, we've never had a dean for technical faculty since then, but Molly Sloan was a, was a wonderful person. And Rosin not and Molly, and at that time there was a consultant who came in after the war, Nathan Brown, who later mm -hmm. became superintendent of schools, who helped build the liberal arts areas. Those three people, truly put together the first faculty. Uh, the chairman of the apparel design division was a marvelous lady, Ernestine Kopp. The chairman of the textile design uh, program was um, Jenny Morris. The, the, I think millinery was Fanny Silva. And um, if I remember correctly, I'm not sure that, but that the first chairman of production management was a man named Sacco. There might have been one person who preceded him. But we had excellent professional people who had lots of experience in industry and also education to help build these programs. So it was not uh, pie in the sky. It was mm -hmm. very realistic. It was very down to earth. And we always, always had industry advisory committees who worked closely with them. Because our goal was to put our graduates in industry in jobs that they could do and in which they could grow. And that has always been our goal. That's how we measure our success. It's the only way we have. It was, yeah, it's very interesting. There was a 1947 class book in that I looked at, and there was a, a, uh, uh, a wish for uh, Dr. Ritter that he would have the buildings that were needed, the faculty that was going to handle the enormous amount of students that they hoped would come to the school. <laughs> so very sweet. Um, he but, was a very sweet man, yeah. Lord Ritter. He was uh, a little man. He was a tailor. He was a tailor, and he and Max Meyer persuaded LaGuardia, who was then the mayor, that they needed skilled workers in the industry. And that was how the first high school came into being. David Dubinsky was involved, and many of the people in the union. Incidentally, there was a wonderful union lady. Her name was Betty Holly Donnelly who was extremely helpful in having the Fashion Institute of Technology become part of the State University of New York. Um, I went with her to Albany to meet with Governor Dewey. She was a very powerful lady and a strong supporter of FIT. Um, the union's position in the development of the college was that, no, they weren't going to get any workers. They weren't going to get any members of the union, but they were going to get good management. Mm -hmm. And without good management, you couldn't have workers. 
So they felt it was their duty to support the development of this institution, and I think that has remained their policy all through the years. We've never gotten a great deal of financial support from the union, but we've had strong support from them in terms of of the need for this kind of an educational institution for New York's fashion industries. Um, the, um, if I remember correctly, you said that the uh, school itself was fu funded uh, by the City University? No, no. Uh, we had no, nothing to do with the City University of New York. We're part it's of the state, state university. university. <laughs> and the law says that a community college is funded, in the beginning, the law said, a community college was funded a third by the state, a third by this, the sponsor, in this case the Board of Education, and a third through tuition. Now that formula has changed somewhat during the years as, as the state university has grown, but it's basically that. And we have remained a community college, although we're, that's not what we are anymore. We are now a specialized institution, but we are financed. With a four degree program. Yes, because program. we not only have the two year degree, which is a community college degree, but we have a four-year Bachelor of Fine Arts, Bachelor of Science degree, and next year we will have, in September, we will have a master's program. So really what we are is a highly specialized institution within the State University program, but financed as a community college. And the reason that has happened is that we have wanted to keep our relationship with the Board of Education of the City of New York rather than with the Board of Higher Education. We've always had a very good, close working relationship with the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And because we have our own Board of Trustees, which we would not have if we were under the Board of Higher Education, we've been able to, to build the way we have felt we mm -hmm. needed to build. Well, then in this school, the Educational Foundation has really been instrumental in providing a lot of the services that would not ordinarily be provided. And still does. It provides now not only the scholarship fund, and this year it was a half a million dollars, but it provides uh, funding for special exhibitions in the Resource Center, for mm -hmm. acquisitions in the library and in the design laboratory. Uh, it subsidizes uh, certain personnel that can't be covered in the college budget. It pays for certain publications for which we can't use public monies. Uh, it sponsors and produces special events that bring part of the community into the institution. Its, its budget is composed of those programs for which public money basically is not available. And then, of course, uh, as each new program comes on stream in the educational sense, a segment of the industry finances it. Mm -hmm. There is no public money for the development of new programs. So when we develop a new program, that money comes from industry. For instance, right now the FER program mm -hmm. is new. That money is coming from industry for the development of the program. Accessories w is a new program. That money will come in to help with the development, the research and the development. It takes about five years to really develop a solid program. And we have always said we, when the industry expresses a need, we are ready to try to fulfill that need if we have the support of the industry. Fashion buying and merchandising, which is the largest program in the college, came into being because of an endowment from Andrew Goodman in memory of his father, Edwin Goodman, mm -hmm. of Bergdorf Goodman. Each program has come on stream that way since the beginning. So that uh, the fashion buying and merchandising was financed by Andrew Goodman, but I assume Today that it's in the operating uh -huh, budget okay. of the college. It's only the development. Right. However, there is an endowment for that program. So the income from the endowment is used for special purposes like providing uh, cultural opportunities for certain students. We have opera tickets mm -hmm. for students, certain travel. That money is used to s as a support. The person who holds the chair has a travel allowance so that she can bring back information to the department. Each program that's endowed has an income that is used for specific purposes relating to the program. The jewelry program, which is the Norman Morris Chair in Jewelry, the income is used for supplies for students, for uh, educational opportunities for certain faculty members in the program, and for scholarship assistance. So each program, when, you, when a program is endowed, the purposes of the use of the income is set forth, and that is done through the foundation. Um, so that when, but when you talk about it's done through the foundation, it's really very much done through you and by you. 
Well, maybe. Uh, which means that. Well, uh, the foundation has a, uh, has a strong board of directors, very powerful officers, an executive committee that functions. Is it a board of directors or a board of trustees? Board of directors. The college has a board of trustees. I see. The college has a board of trustees of nine members, four of whom are appointed by the governor, five by the Board of Education for a period of nine years each. The Educational Foundation has a rotating board appointed for one, two, and three years. It rotates. And officers. And every member of that board and all the areas of the industry represented serves on an active committee within the college. There's a curriculum committee, there's a finance committee, there's a legislative committee, there's a special services committee. There's, but every member serves on a committee in some capacity, in addition to being a director of the board. So they're all active. They yeah, really right. are. No, but I was thinking that before we started, I mentioned, I said, you really ha are a financial person too, because you. Oh were, yes, you know. I handle money. Yeah. I mm -hmm. handle I handle the foundation's endowment fund. Are you involved with budgeting? I do all of the budgeting. You do all of the budget. Yes, I do all of the budgeting, and I present it to the executive committee, which either approves or disapproves, and then it's presented to the board of directors at our annual meeting in April. We have the the foundation has four four meetings a year, the board of directors, and its committees meet when needed. Um, the Finance Committee also meets four times a year. Uh, that's to handle the endowment funds, which, uh, of which I serve as a member. Sure. Um, I'm also mm -hmm. involved in how our monies are used. Mm -hmm. uh, if, for instance, we are, uh, are paying for special exhibitions in the Resource Center, I'm very much involved in the budgets of those exhibitions and the control of those budgets and what goes into the exhibitions. Mm -hmm. I feel that's my responsibility. Since it's a function that's being sponsored by the foundation, I have to be on top of it. Now, this all goes back to the training you got indirectly by working for government, by that's working in public affairs. That's right. It's, it's always a lot of it yeah. came from working yeah. both with Lloyd Landau and Grover Quayle. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Some of it, I suppose, I've learned myself. I'm very often frustrated, I must say. But for the most part... Why are you frustrated? Well, because things don't always move as fast uh -huh. as I'd like them to. And you know, as you get bigger, it gets much more complicated. When you were small and you knew everybody, mm -hmm. it was much easier. Today, I don't know everybody at FIT. We have a faculty of about 500. And uh, okay, we haven't, yeah, we haven't done that. Yeah, right. and uh, uh, faculty and staff. So obviously, I don't know everybody, uh, many of whom are adjunct professors and instructors who come in part time. So I don't even see them. I find it strange to walk into the faculty dining room and not recognize faces when I used to know every single one. Let's do. Some, let's go back and do some comparisons mm -hmm. before we lose that. At the very beginning, um, no, or not at the very beginning, shortly after the very beginning, you had 1,200 students. Yes. All right, and today you have 12,000 students. Yes. 4,000 of whom are full time. 8,000 of whom are part-time. The full-timers live on campus? or Not more? all. No. Only about 1,000 students live on campus. About 3,000 commute. Um, is there room for more than that 1,000? Not at the moment no. until we have another dormitory, which I understand is the president's priority item. We really need to have another dormitory because mm -hmm. students are coming from further distances and it becomes much more difficult to find housing in New York. Mm -hmm. As you know, there was a time when students could find apartments and share them. We can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need another dormitory, and I think President Feldman is working very hard to get that. Um, and when you talk about staff, um, the ratio of staff to students, how many, how many people are on staff? I mean, faculty staff, not administrative. At now? The oh, at, at the beginning and now, as a comparison. It's very hard for me to remember that. Um, can you approximate? No, I think in the beginning we may have had 50 faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew every one of them, so it mm -hmm. couldn't have been much more than that. And How many in, in administration? When I came in administration, there was the president, Mortimer Ritter, there was the dean, uh, Rosalind Snyder, there was the associate dean, Molly uh, Slonim, and there was me. The departments, the programs themselves mm -hmm. had chairmen, who were faculty members. Who were faculty members. members. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anybody else. There was a, a council, Fred Cooper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really don't remember anybody else. Mm -hmm. And today? Oh, today, there's, when I was acting president, I initiated the um, uh, 
associate deans who now have become deans for each of the major divisions. There is an art and design division, there's a liberal arts division, and there's a business and technology division. So you have three major deans. Then you have the dean of faculty, which we which was ostensibly what Dean Snyder had been, which we now have, which is Janice Wyman. We have the Dean of Students. We used to have a Director of Admissions, and we did have a Dean of Students, Marion Brandis. I don't remember what year she came. I think after we moved into the new building. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Dean of Students. We have a Dean of Continuing Education. We have um, a Vice President for Development. Uh, we have a Treasurer. Which and includes fundraising. Well, I don't know no. whether it will or it won't. Uh, at the moment, I'm not quite sure just how extensive. At the moment, I think it, it's the development of relationships within the community. Mm -hmm. I think she represents the president in, in uh, all of the various constituencies of, of uh, the community, the city and the state and the mm -hmm. associations in the area. Uh, I know that she's working very hard on the dormitory mm -hmm. and, and other aspects, but mm -hmm. I don't think per se it's fundraising. Mm -hmm. Most of our fundraising is done through the foundation. Mm -hmm. And the board of directors of the foundation is about to get a new campaign to add to the uh, endowment so that we won't have to worry in the future that we won't have enough money. Yeah. But is the endowment fund at this point uh, a large one? Well, it's over seven million. Mm -hmm. It's not a large endowment as endowments go, mm -hmm. but it's providing what we need at this moment. Mm -hmm. We think we need to extend, expand that endowment to ten million, mm -hmm. hopefully, over the next three mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. That's so that we can increase the financial assistance for students because as costs go up, our students who come mostly from a middle to lower income background need additional Yes, I, I, that's the uh, next thing I want to talk about, but I haven't yet gotten, um, y th th let's just finish the figures on, on faculty. You think it's about 500? No. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have any idea how many it was then? Had to be under 100. Under 100, in the yes. late 40s or, or yeah, early 50s. Had to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe when we moved into this first building, with full and part-time faculty, it went to about 100, 150. And that year was what? When 19. Well, the student students came in in September of 59, but mm -hmm. basically we got underway in 1960. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about uh, mm -hmm. uh, statistics in 1960. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now you started talking about the student body, the composition of the student body. It's predominantly a commuting student body. Students who come from within a commuting distance. Um, students who live in the dormitory, I believe, come from beyond 35 or 40 miles, and of course, um, students who come from foreign countries, many of them live in the dormitory. Um, as, the, as the reputation of FIT grows, applications from more distant areas become more predominant, even from upstate New York, and those students have to be accommodated, and we need more housing mm -hmm. to accommodate mm -hmm. them. Is there a difference in fees charged between Yes, a New York resident student pays half of what of an, an out-of-state resident. The tuition was just increased in that. There is a board of trustees meeting on this month, which is February, in which the board is being asked to increase the, the rate of tuition for resident students, that is New York City and New York State residents, uh, to $1,350 a year. Very mm -hmm. low. Yes. But for out-of-state students, it would be twice that. Mm -hmm. Including out-of-country. Yes. Like yes. Japanese mm -hmm. and so on. It would be $2,700 mm -hmm. for non-resident mm -hmm. students, $1,350 mm -hmm. for resident students. Right. Right. How much participation? But that incidentally yeah. would be effective in the spring of 85. It's yeah. not to be immediate. Yeah. Um, how much participation is there on the part of, of former students of alumni? The director of alumni is Dorothy Hannenberg. Mm -hmm. uh, she is also the director of community resources in the college and she has had a very close working relationship with alumni. Until we had resident students we did not have a very active alumni. Mm -hmm. Commuting students are never a very active alumni. I believe she now has active about you know, five to six thousand, I'm not certain of the number, but approximately five to six thousand active members of the alumni. 
and she is working very diligently to get them more involved in the school. We have, we have uh, two alumni on the board of directors of the Educational Foundation. One is Calvin Klein and the other is Ed Newman of Dan River Mills. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many alumni who teach at FIT, either on a part-time basis, or they come in as critics of, of programs, or even some who are here full-time. Uh, we have a number of outstanding alumni, but most of the names that are known are in the field of design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In merchandising, you don't recognize the names are not promoted. In management, names are not promoted. In communications, names are not promoted. In photography, they're not particularly promoted. Or advertising, you don't know the names. The only names that you know are those who design clothes. So, and of those, most of the young, successful designers, and I say this advisedly, are graduates of FIT, mm -hmm. like Norma Kamali, Calvin yeah. Klein, John Anthony, Bill Hare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Could we, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the composition of the faculty? Uh, because I gather that there are some people who are here as full-time professors or whatever their titles are, but many others who are adjuncts. And yes, uh, that, that's true in any educational institution. And, and basically, to begin with, it's because of budgetary uh, restrictions. You don't always have the kind of budget that you require to have full-time faculty for every program. But in our case, it's also because we want more contemporary, current knowledge from the industry. And adjunct professors bring that. Mm -hmm. Full-time tenured professors don't always have an opportunity to go back into the industry. This is, of course, true in our technical areas, more so than in the liberal arts areas. But we insist when we employ a full-time faculty that they've had at least five years of executive experience doing what they're teaching. So that everybody who teaches in the school has had business background. Everybody who teaches any technical subject in mm -hmm. the school has mm -hmm. had business background. Of course, if they are English teachers or something of that sort, that they've uh, had other. They may, may have published. They may mm -hmm. have. They may have had other experiences right. that compensate. <coughs> but it is not um, that they are, have been in the fashion industry. There's no special reason for that. Um, one last question. If no, two questions. Uh, what? And who were the major influences in your life? When I was in high school, this goes back a long time, I had a wonderful English teacher. She was a great influence. She taught me to read. She taught me to appreciate literature. She taught me to speak. There was another teacher, even in an earlier period, who really taught me what it was to be human, to be thoughtful, to care about other people. I needed that during those years. I didn't have a mother, and my father was involved in all of his own problems. Those two teachers were very helpful to me. Uh, when I went to work, I would say that Grover was an influence, and I would say that Jack Madigan was an influence, and I would say that Edward Weinfeld was an influence. There are three men. Uh, in business, I don't think I've really been influenced by any particular woman. I, there are many I admire and many I respect. But I don't know that they've had any particular influence on me. I did have a music teacher in New York, as a matter of mm -hmm. fact. I continued whenever I could to study music. She was very helpful to me. Um, in many ways, she taught me how to enjoy relaxing and how to enjoy the time that I had with music. Um, I think both my husbands have been influential in my life. I know that my first husband was very influential. He was a very capable, professional, highly intelligent, I think the most competent diagnostician and doctor I have ever known. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And at FIT, no, I was greatly influenced at FIT by Samuel Deitch. He was a close friend, a close associate. He cared about what I could accomplish. He always made me believe I could do more. He was a great influence in my life. He was. Mm -hmm. I have many friends. I've, I've really good friends. They're not just acquaintances. I've rarely lost a friend. If I have, uh, I'm not aware of it. And many of those friends are women as well mm -hmm. as men. And I enjoy being with them. I enjoy talking with them. Um, I think early on I mentioned Bert Reinitz. Mm -hmm. I think Bert influenced me a great deal. He taught me a lot. Well, I, I, I don't know whether this is the kind of influence yeah, right, you're talking yeah. about, but... Um, uh, yes, it is. Sure it is. Um, I was just wondering how you acquired the almost innate feeling about the people that you met, because clearly from your history, one person led to another. Well, I'm a Southerner, <coughs> and maybe because of the way in which I grew up and the community in which I grew up, I learned to listen. Mm -hmm. I've always listened to other people. I think that's very important. I think you must hear what other people have to say before they will listen to you. I don't think I was ever very pushy. I don't think I ever tried to step on anybody. I never did deliberately in any event. If it happened, mm -hmm. it happened inadvertently. And I, I don't know of an incident in which it happened. I don't think I've ever tried to, to um, I don't know quite how to say this, but I'm not immodest, but um, to a degree I'm fairly modest. I don't think I've, I have accomplished all mm -hmm. that much, certainly not by myself. I've had lots of help. I'm very proud of what I've done. One of the proudest things, of course, in my life is the fact that the union and the faculty asked the Board of Trustees to name the Resource Center at FIT for me. I think this is a great tribute, and I'm, I'm well aware of what it means, and I certainly do appreciate it in every sense of the word. I think it's truly a tribute. I don't know that I deserved it, but I, but I appreciate it. And to have had that happen when I would, I'm here to enjoy it and to, to want to be part of it, I think is, is certainly most unusual. Most Indeed unusual. Indeed it is. Another thing that I, I have a friend right now who influences me a great deal, and she's my doctor. She happens to be the medical director of FIT. And you th say, why do I need to be influenced at this late stage of my life? I'm 68 years old. Um, I've had cancer, 1971, just after the first year I was married. I had to have a mastectomy. And then in 1977, I had two other cancer operations. Uh, again, I've had to learn to live with that. Um, my doctor now, Martha Cottrell, is a very understanding lady. And when I have certain problems, I can discuss them with her. I don't have a psychiatrist. She acts as my psychiatrist, medical physician. She listens to my problems. I listen to hers. But in many ways, she's very helpful to me. And I think I'm helpful to her also. It's a, it's a good rapport. You have to feel your way as you mm -hmm. go in this world. I don't think you can ever run before you walk. Uh, sometimes you're tempted to. One final question. If, if it were possible to live your life over, I wouldn't change, change it. Change? No, no, I wouldn't change it. How can you change? How can you wish to change your life? How do you know what would have happened? Sure, when I was young, I was gung-ho to be, a, to be a, a, a successful pianist and to have great, great, great skill. I would never have become that. My temperament, I know now, is not such that I could ever have done the technical work that was necessary to become a great concert pianist. In addition to which, I think is so much more a people person that I think that would have been. Too that's exactly the point. Life, yeah. I am a people person. I love people. Right. I like to be with people. I like to entertain in my home, which I don't do enough of now. I like all the things that go with being with people. 
I just enjoy it. Very good.